Hey, want to pass the NCLEX? Well, let's walk through some key questions that you'll need to know. And if you want a ton of questions with rationales for free, simply click the link in the description below to create your free simple nursing account. All right, let's walk through this case study together and always remember to mentally highlight the keywords that risk safety. So starting at the top, remember to read the intro and think safety. Think of three things that are gonna kill or harm this client with immobility. So number one, skin breakdown and pressure injuries is a huge risk for safety. Number two is contractures or basically stiffening of the joints. And number three is a risk for blood clots or even venous stasis since the client is bedridden. Now step number two, look at the tabs and mentally highlight keywords that risk safety. So now let's look at tab number one, the diagnosis list. So again, we're only reviewing this. The client has type two diabetes, left extremity paralysis, as well as PAD, which is a huge risk for skin breakdown. Also decreased perfusion and delayed wound healing. Now let's click over to tab number two. We have to consult with the wound nurse, also clean the dorsogluteal wound with normal saline and pack it with calcium alginate dressing every single day. This indicates a pressure injury is present. Also a culture for the dorsogluteal wound just to check for a potential infection. Now, step number three, always find these keywords before looking at each item or each question. So now that we found each key term that risks safety, you can now go through each item more confidently when answering each specific question. So remember, don't be scared, be prepared. Simply find each key term that risks safety before jumping into the question. All right, let's dive into the question. The question's asking which of the following should be included? And it's a select all that apply question. I hate SATA questions just as much as you do. And remember, SATA is just one letter away from Satan. Okay, now the problem here is signs and symptoms of infected pressure injury. So for the solution, before looking at the options, think about signs and symptoms of an infection. So we're thinking fever, warm, redness, or even foul smelling drainage. If you see those key terms, it's most likely an infection on the NCLEX. Now let's look at the options here. The first option is fever. Well, yes, of course, this is correct. Remember, the temperature increases to fight the infection. How about the next option? Foul-smelling drainage. Yes, infected wound debris produces odor. How about option number three? Wound redness. Of course. Just simply look at the key terms here. It's associated with irritation from infection. Now, option four is also correct here. Wound that is warm to touch. Remember, localized warmth is due to that increased blood flow to fight the infection. Now, the tricky one was the last option, edema, basically that waterbed skin. Well, the body here increases nutrients as well as fluids and WBCs to that area to destroy the infection. So in this case, all the options are correct. And you got to watch out for that on the NCLEX because this could happen. Okay, now on to the matrix questions. That was weird. It's probably a glitch in the matrix. All right, now for the next question. The question is asking for each assessment finding, click to specify if this indicates a stage one, stage two, stage three, or stage four pressure injury. And remember, each finding may support more than one stage. The problem here is we have to identify the types of pressure injuries. So for the solution, before looking at the options and getting super confused, stop and think about the different types and stages of pressure injuries as well as the signs and symptoms of each. So to make this super simple, simply think four layers of skin for four stages of pressure injury. So in stage number one, only one layer of skin is affected, the epidermis. So we see non-blanchable redness of skin that is intact. So remember, only the epidermis is affected. And in stage two, we have two layers of skin that is affected. So remember, the skin breaks, we have an open wound affecting both the epidermis as well as the dermis. And the skin appears red or pink on the wound bed. Now, what do you think stage three would be? Well, yes, of course, three layers of skin affected. This is what's known as full thickness skin loss, extending down in the subcutaneous tissue. So through the epidermis and the dermis down to the subcutaneous fatty tissue. Now, moving on to stage four. Well, what do you think that's gonna be? Of course, four layers affected. It extends all the way down into the muscle, even the bone and tendon. Oh, this one's really serious. But it's not as serious as the unstageable, the full thickness skin loss with eschar and even sloth. 
All right, now finally for the options, let's go through the assessment findings and find if it's stage one, two, three, or four. So starting with non-blanchable erythema. So simply think, one layer of skin affected, so it's gotta be stage one. The key term is non-blanchable, intact red skin here. Now how about the next one here? Opening of the dermis and epidermis. So again, let the question help you. Epidermis and dermis, we have two layers of skin affected, so it's gotta be type two. Now moving on to the next one. Extends into the subcutaneous tissue. Now it sounds a lot like we have three layers of skin affected, so it's gotta be stage three. And the last one here involves fascia, muscle, and even possibly bone. So man, that is four layers affected, so it's gotta be stage number four. This question's asking to select three diagnoses that increases the client's risk for pressure injury development. The problem here is conditions that increase the risk for pressure injury. So for the solution, before looking at the options, what do you think is going to increase pressure injury risk? Well, number one is immobility. Because remember, bedridden clients have extended pressure even on bony prominences. Number two is diabetes, which I call diatretes, very sugary, syrupy blood. The blood is turned to mud from all that high sugar. And this leads to poor blood flow and poor wound healing. Now, the last one here is vascular disease. So any type of vascular disease impairs circulation, which impairs healing. So now let's dive into the diagnosis and pick three. First is hypothyroidism. Well, this one's incorrect. Hypothyroidism causes dry skin and fatigue, even weight gain. There's no significant increase in the risk of pressure injury here. What about diabetes mellitus type 2? Well, yes, of course. Remember, diabetes is diatretes from all that sugar in the blood. So this leads to poor blood flow and delayed wound healing and increases the risk for pressure injury. How about peripheral arterial disease, that PAD? Well, again, let the name help you. Peripheral arterial disease. There's a disease in the arteries here. So, of course, we're going to see impaired circulation and decreased perfusion that impairs oxygen. So, this one is correct. What about paralysis of the lower extremities? Well, paralysis leads to decreased blood flow and even impaired sensation. Now, the client with paralyzed legs may not notice pain, pressure, or even injury, which increases their risk. Now, the last option is incorrect because GERD is just fancy words for gastric reflux or basically heartburn, that indigestion. But it doesn't increase the risk for pressure injury on the skin. That's more of a GI thing. This question is asking us to complete the following sentence by choosing from the list of options. The problem here is the HCP orders related to the infected pressure injury. So for the solution, before looking at the options, think about safety. Number one is culture the wound first before giving antibiotics. Then we apply wound care. Number two is frequent skin assessments. And the last one here is reposition frequently as well as increase fluids. Okay, now that we brainstormed, let's dive into the options here. So the question's asking, the nurse must first blank followed by blank. But if you were to ask me, the nurse must first grab some wine followed by a back massage. All right, but serious, the nurse must first blank. So let's look at response one. Are we going to culture the dorsogluteal wound? Well, yes, this is priority because it determines the causing factor of the infection. Now, the rest of the options in column one are incorrect because we're not going to administer the IV antibiotics. This should only be done after the culture is performed. And we're not going to consult with the wound care nurse because this is not the priority or that first initial action. It should always be to culture the wound. So now that we know that we must first culture that wound, what are we going to follow up doing? Well, the correct answer here in option two is administer the IV antibiotic. This directly addresses the wound infection. And the rest of the options are incorrect, and let me explain why. Inserting an indwelling urethral catheter, fancy words for a Foley, this action does not address the infected pressure injury. And the last option is incorrect because simply administering zinc 20 milligrams by mouth is not the thing to do. We're simply giving the client a vitamin, and the client needs antibiotics. This question is asking us to click to specify the nursing action that is appropriate for the client. Each category may support more than one potential action. The problem here is writing a plan of care for stage 3 dorsogluteal pressure injury. So for the solution, before looking at the options, think about interventions for a dorsogluteal pressure injury. So number one, we have to assess the skin and document it. 
Number two is always cold to the wound first, then give antibiotics, and then follow up with wound care. Also, we got to be thinking about frequent position changes and even hygiene care. And then very lastly is nutrition. Increase those fluids and increase protein intake. Now, finally, let's look at the options here, starting with the category incontinence care. So what are we going to do for nursing actions? Well, the first option is correct. The wound is in an area which can be contaminated with feces. In addition to routine incontinence care, additional measures should be in place to avoid fecal contamination in that wound. So yes, we have to protect the wound and avoid contamination. Now the next option, routine incontinence care should occur, is wrong. And here's why. It requires frequent, not just routine care. Now let's move on to pain. The first option is correct. The nurse should evaluate for pain and treat accordingly. How about the next one here? Pressure injuries are not painful and do not require comfort measures. Well, no, that's completely wrong. Stage 3 dorsogluteal wounds are likely to be very uncomfortable, so we can't choose that one. Now, moving on to hydration here. Are we going to choose the first option? Well, this is inaccurate information. Extra hydration for this client is not required, when actually it is. So we have to choose the next option. Remember, hydration is critical for overall skin health. It increases oxygen as well as nutrients to the skin and promotes skin strength. Oh, f This next one is a SATA question. And you know what they say, SATA is just one letter away from Satan. All right, guys, let's break this question down. The question's asking us to select statements that indicate teaching has been successful. The problem here is correct teaching about pressure injury. So for the solution, before looking at the options, think about important teaching for pressure injuries. Well, number one, proper hygiene and wound care. Number two is avoid prolonged pressure, for example, being in bed or in one place for too long. And number three, think about the importance of nutrition. We always increase fluids and increase protein. So now let's look at the options here. Option one shows a statement that I should avoid staying in the same position for more than two hours. Well, yes, this is good. It helps prevent excess pressure that can lead to skin breakdown. How about the next one here? I'm going to consume a diet high in protein and vitamin C. Yes, the key term here is protein. It facilitates wound healing. How about option three here? My bed linens should remain dry and wrinkle-free. Of course, this decreases the risk for friction and shearing forces that can damage the skin. Now, the next option is incorrect. It is acceptable to limit fluids. No, we want to increase fluid as well as protein to protect the skin. Now, the last option is incorrect here. Sitting on hard surfaces, like a hard chair, is best treatment for my pressure injury. No, we want to avoid hard surfaces. This can cause increased pressure and can further damage existing pressure injuries. Whoa! Head to the link in the description below for way more NGN rationales just like this. All right, let's dive into this question. We're being asked to click to highlight the findings that require immediate follow-up. So simply think safety. The problem here is the client is requiring an NG tube for feedings. So for the solution, before looking at the options, think of two things that can kill or harm the client with NG tube feedings. Well, number one, we always verify placement before feeding. The worst possible scenario is that tube gets dislodged from the stomach and now fills up the lungs with feeding. You can simply kill your client that way. And number two is the huge risk for aspiration. Now let's look at the big chunk of information here. So as we scroll through the case study, look at the key term here. The client is supine at 10 degrees. Guys, that's a huge risk for aspiration. The client should be in Fowler's or at least high Fowler's position with the head of the bed elevated. Now scrolling down, 200 ml of gastric aspiration was noted and reintroduced to the client. And 60 ml of enteral feeding solution was administered. So we definitely need to highlight this because it's concerning finding. So fancy words for the enteral feeding was administered and the residual showed 200 mLs. So we should hold the feeding and we need to report this to the HCP. Now the next thing we're gonna highlight is the nasogastric tube was flushed with 10 mLs of tap water at completion. Now the reason we're highlighting it is because we're not administering 10 mLs. We have to flush with 30 to 60 mLs of water. And don't let the tap water distract you. On the NCLEX, the water can be tapped. All right, another complicated question. Let's make it simple here. For each nursing intervention below, click to specify if the intervention is appropriate for clients with peripheral venous disease 
peripheral arterial disease, or varicose veins. Now, each intervention may support more than one disease. So the problem here is interventions for vascular diseases. Now for the solution. Before looking at the options, what do you know about vascular disease? Well, number one, we have to promote circulation. So think PAD, let the name help you. You have to hang the leg to provide circulation. And for PVD, you simply use the V to elevate the leg. Also consider smoking cessation, or basically stop smoking, and weight reduction. Okay, now finally, let's dive into the options. Starting with PVD, that peripheral venous disease. Are we going to place the leg in a dependent position to relieve pain? No, because remember, PVD, you have to elevate the leg. What about promoting weight reduction? Well, of course, that's always a good choice on the NCLEX. But in this case, it reduces strain on the cardiovascular system and improves blood flow. What about elevating the leg four to five times a day? Yes, let the name help you, elevating the leg with PVD. How about applying anti-embolism stockings as prescribed? Yes, of course. This actually helps prevent clots in deep veins. How about the last one here? Encourage tobacco cessation. So basically, stop smoking. Yes, this is always a good choice on the NCLEX. Tobacco impairs the vessels by constricting and impairs or slows blood flow. Now let's move on to PAD, peripheral arterial disease. Are we going to place the leg in a dependent position to relieve pain? Yes, of course, because let the name help you. PAD, we hang the leg, basically dangle the leg. This actually promotes circulation down to the toes. What about the next one? Promote weight reduction. Of course, this is always a good choice on the NCLEX to reduce weight. How about elevating the legs four to five times throughout the day? No, that is only for PVD or venous issues. What about applying anti-air embolism stockings as prescribed? No, we don't want to do that because we have an arterial problem. And what about the last one? Tobacco. Yes, stop tobacco. So these ones should always be correct. Remember, weight and tobacco reduction is always encouraged on the NCLEX. Now, lastly is varicose veins. Are we going to place the legs in dependent position to relieve pain? No, let the name help you. The key term is veins. So remember, veins, you elevate the legs. And there it is again, promoting weight reduction, of course. How about elevating the legs four to five times a day? Yes, let the name help you. It's a venous condition, so we elevate. What about applying anti-embolism stockings as prescribed? Yes, of course. Extra squeeze helps to actually relieve the symptoms. And the very last one, stopping smoking, is always a good choice. Okay, last question for today's video coming right up. And if you can't get enough of these, then you can get way more by just clicking the link in the description below. Now for the infamous bow tie questions, which can be really complicated, but let's make it simple. So the question is asking us to complete the diagram by dragging the choices to identify number one, the condition, number two, the actions to address the condition, basically, how are we going to save the client's life? And number three, parameters to monitor for to keep the client safe. Now, in terms of the problem here, Let's look at the case study and find the key words that risk safety. So starting at the top, we see the client is admitted for shortness of breath, which could be anything. So let's click under tab number one and see what we find. So we see shortness of breath, which we already knew, as well as respiratory distress when ambulating. Fancy words for when walking. Next, we see a myocardial infarction, or basically an MI heart attack about one month ago. Simply think MI, heart muscles die, leading to heart failure. The next finding is the client is unable to get his medication, so that's not good. As well as ibuprofen is used for pain. Remember, ibuprofen is an NSAID, and on the NCLEX, NSAIDs are not good for the body, especially for heart failure, because it actually worsens heart failure. The next finding is ronchi in the lungs. This simply means lung fluid. So simply think, HF for heart failure, we have HF, heavy fluid in the body. Clients can actually drown in their own fluid. Now look at this next key term, S3 gallop. This is just fancy words for a heart murmur. And it may be from the heart attack because remember, MI, heart muscles die. The next key term is three plus pitting edema in the legs. Remember, edema is simply that waterbed skin because again, HF for heart failure, we see HF, heavy fluid in the body. Now let's look at the vital signs. And oh boy, these are all messed up. The blood pressure is super high, 159 over 88. So that is really high because again, heavy fluid with heart failure. 
Heart rate is up at 110, the respiratory rate is at 26, but take a look at this oxygen saturation. It's at 92% on room air, and it's probably from all that lung fluid, and the temperature is fine. So now that we have all this info, simply stop and think. Think about what kills the client first. Well, think HF for heart failure, we have HF, heavy fluid in the body. The lungs are filling with fluid, and the client is likely to drown in their own fluids. Now let's click over to tab number two and see the labs. The first thing we see is a BNP of 845, holy guacamole. Now this case study is nice because it gives us the normal range, but look at that normal range. It maxes out at 100. So use the memory trick. BNP is just bulging ventricles, bulging from all that heavy fluid inside the heart with heart failure. Because the heart has failed as a pump, so we can't pump blood or even fluids forward. The next thing we see is an echo or an echocardiogram, and it's at 35%. Normally, it's above 50%. So an echo means that the heart is pumping out less blood to the body. And remember, HF for heart failure, the heart is failing as a pump, so we see HF, heavy fluid inside the body. So for the solution, we have a lot of information here. So before looking at the options and getting confused, what do you know about the data findings? Always think what kills or harms the client first. So remember, HF for heart failure is HF, heavy fluid in the body. And let the case study help you. Look at those key terms that we just identified. MI, heart muscles die, so the heart fails as a pump. The ronchi in the lower lungs is simply lung fluid from all that heavy fluid from heart failure. Three plus pitting edema in the legs, we have edema, that waterbed skin. So the entire body is filling with water as well as the high blood pressure from heavy fluid, and 92% of oxygen on room air, probably from that high fluid. And BMP is at 845, and the echo is low at 35%. Woo! Now, all that information points us to option number one, heart failure, because of course, it must be heart failure with all that heavy fluid based on all the details we just mentioned. Now, the rest of the options are incorrect, and I can explain why. In option two, ARDS is simply hard lungs. Now, it's due to fluid overload in those lung sacs, those alveoli, but it's more present with infection, which we don't see here. Also, extreme shortness of breath, and our client only has minor shortness of breath. Now, option three is incorrect because cardiogenic shock, simply think S for shock, S for severely low blood pressure. And our client here has high blood pressure, actually really high blood pressure. Now, option four is incorrect because a pulmonary embolism, or a PE, is simply a blood clot in the lungs. And these clients have severe chest pain and extreme shortness of breath, which our client doesn't have. Okay, now in terms of actions, before looking at the options, think about the data in the case study. Then think about actions that are going to save the client's life. So we know the client has heavy fluid in the body. So what action are you going to take? Okay, now let's look at the options here. So option number one is correct. The client has heart failure, that heavy fluid, in the body. So we definitely need to monitor and limit that water intake. How about option number two? Discontinue ibuprofen, which is an NSAID. Remember, NSAIDs are not good for heart failure. It's going to make it worse. So option two is also correct. How about option three? Well, this one is definitely incorrect. Limiting sodium intake to 5,000 a day? What? No, that is not a limit at all. That's actually an excess. A true limit is no more than 2,000 milligrams, or simply 2 grams a day. How about option four, giving oxygen? Well, yes, this is correct. Look at the client's O2 set. It's at 92%, so we definitely need to give oxygen to boost it up. Now, the last option is incorrect because, again, with the excess, 5 liters of water is way too much. That's nearly 1.5 gallons. We need to limit that fluid because the client already has heavy fluid in the body, so limiting it to 2 liters max per day. Okay, now very lastly, the parameters to monitor for. So once again, before looking at the options, think about the data in the case study. What would you monitor for to keep the client safe? Well, number one is daily weights, because remember that heavy fluid in the body. Number two is that dangerously high blood pressure. And then I'm thinking about the BNP. Okay, now let's look at the options here. Option one is correct. Simply remember weight gain equals water gain. And remember these key numbers for the NCLEX. Two to three pounds of weight gain in 24 hours, we must report this to the HCP because the client can die from the fluids in their lungs. Now the next two options are incorrect. 
Because in option two, this one was a close one, but it's wrong. Because there's no indication of hypoxia in the data shown. And we'd expect the lab values to show this. And there's no indication of severe lung or metabolic issues here. Now, option three is also incorrect because x-ray of the legs, no. On the NCLEX, this is mainly for broken bones. Now, what about option number four, strict I's and O's? Well, remember, HF for heart failure, think HF, heavy fluid in the body. So this is correct. We want to monitor very closely what goes in and what comes out. Now, option five is incorrect. Musculoskeletal function? No, we have a mucho fluid problem, not a musculoskeletal problem. So no, the problem is not in the bones or even the muscles here. The only problem is in the heart muscles not pumping right, and now fluid backs up into the body. Wow, NGN questions are no joke, but you're doing great. Get access to way more NGN questions, plus all of this. And you can sign up for free by simply clicking the link in the description below.